Were you aware that the proposed espionage activities were to be paid for using campaign funds? I do not recall, Senator. Do you recall any of the directives that you uh, undertook at the committee to re-elect the president? Uh, well, uh, that would have to depend, of course, on what directives you were referring to, Senator. But uh, in general, I would have to say that, that you do not recall. That, uh, yeah, that's correct, Senator. That was today's guest, Jim Meskimen, as Senator Edward Gurney, questioning Hamish Linklater as Jeb Magruder in a scene from the limited series Gaslit, starring Sean Penn and Julia Roberts. Hello and welcome to episode 108 of the Occasional Film Podcast, the occasional companion podcast to the Fast Cheap Movie Thoughts blog. I'm the blog's editor, John Gaspard. Today's episode is a deep dive into the life of a character actor, in this case, actor and impressionist Jim Meskimen. I first met Jim via TikTok, where he posts his fantastic celebrity impressions. They're all um, so unique, and, and, and I guess that's the thing about them, that we recognize um, right. it, through mannerisms and, and also the, vo- the vocal tone. Yeah, and it's sort of, it's really a viewpoint thing. You know, you just sort of change your viewpoint. If you're George Clooney, you just have a different way of expressing yourself. Morgan Freeman as well. Everything sounds warm and delightful. Robert De Niro, it's a whole other thing. You can't be too happy about it because, <laughs> after all, his mouth is upside down. <laughs> it's funny. Everyone's having a good time. It's nice. <laughs> However, today's conversation is not about those impressions. It's about how he established and built and continues to build his career as an in-demand character and voice actor. If you want to hear more about his work as an impressionist, don't despair. My occasional co-host, Jim Cunningham, and I had that conversation with Jim Meskimen, and you can find it in episode 222 of Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast, which is available wherever you get your podcasts. Check the show notes for a link. One advantage Jim Meskimen had was that he grew up around a working actor, his mother. So that's where we started our conversation. Today we're going to talk about your life as an actor and uh, having a diversified pool of things to draw from to to be a a working actor. I listened to a couple other interviews with you, and there was one point they kept coming to that I wanted to avoid, which was immediately talking about your mother. (laughs) However, I had what I thought was an interesting connection with her, and then my friend Jim Cunningham here taught me my connection is and was that we went to the same high school, Southwest High School in Minneapolis. So I thought, well, that's my great connection. And then my friend Jim here, who is uh, one of the reasons he's here is because he is a a working actor as well, but in a much smaller market here in the Twin Cities. So I thought Mm -hmm. having him as part of this chat would be interesting. Jim, what is your story? And he happens to have the name of Cunningham. Well, Well, we're going to get to that. Here we go. (laughs) Therein lies the story. Uh, Your mother made an appearance along with some other famous TV moms at, um, you know, we're very proud of the fact that Spam is produced here in Minnesota. That's right, that's right. And there is a, uh, there's a museum. It's that important to us Minnesotans. Uh, yes, I know she's been there. We had some Spam swag that she gave us one time. Well, well there, it was <laughs> from that. She came as a, a famous mom, uh, <laughs> along with some other famous TV moms, Barbara Billingsley and- uh-huh. And Florence, maybe, Florence Henderson. I think so, yeah, yeah, right. And I was um, uh, the MC of, of that event, and I was interviewing them as they arrived on the red carpet. And I said to your mother, oh, it's, uh, I'm just so thrilled to meet you because my last name is Cunningham. And, and more than that, my, my dad's name is actually Richard Cunningham, and so is my brother. Oh, my gosh. And during the height of the Happy Days craze, um, <laughs> we literally had to have an unlisted phone number because that third <laughs> phone call was, is Fonzie there? <laughs> oh my God, oh and my God, what said, a pain. Could, you have to prove to me that your name is Cunningham. <laughs> so I took out my wallet and showed her my <laughs> driver's license. <laughs> oh, you poor darling. And she gave me a nice hug and a peck on the cheek. And it was just- Wow. I, wow. Uh, I, cherish, I cherish the memory. That's really sweet. That's hilarious. She challenged you like someone would make that up, you know, so she had to really get to the bottom of that one. <laughs> but your mother was just charming and a delight. That's great. Yeah, sorry, we got off on a tangent. We've given well, the elephant in the room some peanuts. We're shoving it off to the side. For well, I, I, if I may say it is it is no problem at all. I love to talk about my mom because she has she has uh, blazed such a path 
for me, not in terms of like, you know, any kind of practical nepotism, but just because everyone loves her and loves what she represents. And so I find it very easy to make friends with strangers in this way, because you, you're already kind of disposed to, you know, well, he must not be such a schmuck, you know, he's got this mom. And uh, so I, I'm always very happy to talk about her. She's a delight and uh, she's 93. She uh, lives very close by and she's very happy and enjoying her retirement. Well, Excellent. Excellent. All right. So we want to talk about being a working actor. But before we dive into the acting part, I know you when you started out, you were focused maybe more on art and cartooning yeah. and that. Mm -hmm. How did you make the switch from that to acting? Well, I, I, I kept both plates spinning. So I, you know, I studied, uh, I, I taught myself to cartoon and illustrate and uh, enough to enough to be a professional, you know, not, not enough to be a super genius uh, kind of in demand, uh, tremendous demand person, but enough to, to work. And, and I did that in New York City. And uh, I, I had this need uh, to perform. And so I also did plays. I would do little projects. I would perform, you know, when I could. Uh, when I went to college, I didn't take theater classes, but I would do plays, you know, people would audition. And if there was a guy that you know, I was very good at accents. So you always needed a funny guy with an accent sometimes. You know, I, I could get the part of the old man or the old <laughs> French guy or whatever. And that I just was always a, a few clicks above uh, the, the rest of, of my fellows there. So I really kept both these activities going while I was sorting out which one was going to be the path. Because I really honestly wasn't <clears throat> clear on what I'd be doing. And, and I, I, I felt strong feelings about both, but I didn't feel at that time, I didn't see how I could mesh them together. I didn't see how one was going to be, have to be jettisoned completely. And uh, it took me a while to figure that out. And when I did, it was a big relief. And I went, okay, I, I know why I want to pursue acting. I know what's honorable about it. I know why it's right for me at this time. And so I'm going to go for it. And then I went with full energy towards that. But I always, I mean, I haven't forgotten how to draw or paint and I do it now, I, I'm older, I'm 62 now. That was when I was 23. So at this point in my life, I wouldn't mind sitting at home and painting a little bit and being away from everybody. But at the time I felt like I needed a more social uh, existence, a more social career that would have more collaborative uh, aspects. Uh, as you kind of look back on things, uh, do you, uh... You remember some of the first things that you got that were maybe, you know, um, of note? Yeah, yeah. I, I started off, uh, I was, I, I came to New York and I started a bunch of things all at once because uh, New York is a great way to, a great place to uh, start, get started, you know, and start things and be a, a starter. So <laughs> I, I, uh, I was studying uh, acting and I was studying improv. I, I, I had a false start. I went and studied at the Stella Adler School for a while, which was a disaster. And I vectored off of that as fast as I could. And I got into improv, which was much more suited to my temperament. And I think it's better training in general. So I was doing that. I was looking for an agent. And I was also supporting myself as an illustrator cartoonist in the meantime. So I didn't have to be a waiter. I could have an actually pretty decent job. Uh, so the first things I got had to do with my ability to do impressions and be a voice actor. So my improv group that I was in had a gig weekly doing... Um, uh, what was then a, a regular feature of the old McNeil Lair Report, if you ever remember that yeah. show. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The McNeil Lair Report, which was a news show. It was like a hard news show, but it had a funny section every Friday. And they would take the political cartoons of the day. And just by kind of zooming in and out and changing panels, they would sort of, you know, semi-animate it statically. And they would add voices to it, though. And then they hired us to do the voices of, you know, Boris Yeltsin and Reagan and whatever was happening at the time. And we'd go in every Friday and for like, I, I believe I'm right. I, I was my first after a job and I think I made 114 bucks a week, but it was like 114 bucks a week, you know? <laughs> Back then when a, a ride on the subway was 50 cents, that was like, this is okay. So that was a, that was a nice kind of like, oh, that's a stability, you know? Cause I think I did, you know, we did a whole, I don't know, season or more of it. And every week, you know, it was kind of cool. My biggest breakthrough uh, came in the area of, of on-camera commercials. And I had remembered that my mom, when she was a single mom, uh, she would uh, 
you know, every now and then before happy days, right? She would get guest spots on things like Mannix and Mission Impossible and Hawaii Five-0, and but those were pretty few and far between. And then, she, but if we got a commercial, you know, if she got booked a commercial, it was like, oh, you know, thank God, because it would generate enough income, you know, through residuals for her. And back then, commercials paid very, very well. Today, it's it's more rare, as you know, probably Jim. It's uh, you know, it's kind of a disappearing thing, but uh, as things go on the internet, but uh, a network commercial back then could could help you stay alive. So I had that in my mind. I was like, you know, I need to get into commercials <laughs> because I remember this from my, from my childhood. We survived. We ate. Uh, it was good. So I auditioned, and eventually, you know, after a couple of years, actually two years at least of of going on a lot of things as a young man, uh, I started to get into commercials. And there was one very, very lucky day that changed my life completely. And it had everything to do with what, what whatever else I was studying, because I was studying communication at that time. I was studying improv at that time. And those things came together in a beautiful way. And I had an audition for a grocery chain uh, out of Texas called Skaggs Alpha Beta. The, the euphonious name of Skaggs Alpha Beta. And uh, they were looking for a spokesman to interview people in the store. And they had had some market research that told them that, you know, people don't, you call yourself the friendliest place in town, but you're not so friendly. So they wanted a friendly spokesman who could talk to people, actual real people and have fun and whatever, you know, and, and be clean and not insult people. And that was what I had been studying in improv, you know, clean comedy, supportive comedy, you know, not cutting the legs out from people. So I got this uh, audition. I, I went physically and did it. And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, th that's great. We're going to hire you. I'm like, great. It's like three commercials and three regional commercials, which is not a huge deal. But it's for me, it was like, well, this is great. Then after we did those three commercials, they came back about a month later and said, all right, we want you to be our spokesman do all our stuff all year long. We'll give you a contract, radio, TV, uh, photo, you know, put you in the newspaper, the little, you know, the, the circulars and billboards and what have you. And it was like 40 grand. And I'm like, oh my God, I didn't even know this existed. My mom never had anything like this. This is like new territory. Well, I did that for five years for that company. And every, every year the, the price went up, the contract got sweeter. By the end of it, I was making, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year just on that job, which would take about seven days a year to do. And that changed my life because it gave me tremendous confidence because I created all the material. I improvised every second of it. Well, maybe not every second, but, you know, and it gave me the wherewithal to exist in New York comfortably without having to really sweat the day job and to do plays and to do things that, you know, if you have time, you go and you do improv shows and you don't worry about, am I making any money? You don't sweat it. So, and, uh, and then I, I actually got known because the footage, I, I would take the footage and I would cut it into reels and I would send that around. And I got more spokes jobs, more spokesman jobs. So, you know, it, it was like a side business that sort of developed out of nowhere. Off of one audition sometimes it makes me scared to think what if i was late what if i didn't make it that audition life yeah. would be so so different somewhere uh, in the multiverse if that's happening or that poor sucker in the multiverse <laughs> but that's... he probably has all my hair so it's fine <laughs> Did did you do any uh, with your mom? You know, uh, uh, on happy days again with the mom. I'm sorry. I'm just. I was just thinking as a young uh, as a young kid. Maybe where, did you do any uh, uh, you know walk ons or extra work on any of the shows your mom was doing? No. The only time when she then when she became Marion Cunningham, uh, your pseudo mom. Yes. She got me in into an episode and my sister, not the same episode, but we both, she exercised a little bit, you know, and, and it happens to be one of the most famous episodes of Happy Days that I was in. I'm the one, a young man, 17, on the beach, looking buff, and I come and announce the fact that they've caught a shark out oh. in the water, and then the rest of the show is about how Fonzie's going to jump the, jump shark. the shark. Wow. But it sounds like growing up that, that you learned the life of a working actor because you lived with a working actor. Is that safe to say? A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, I, I think one of my primary uh, advantages in, in, in my life has been that I saw what it is, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and what it isn't. 
uh, and I saw my, my mom also was particularly driven and also uh, focused and intent. You know, she's a, a, a higher, high achiever. So whereas a lot of actors go, well, I'm waiting for my agent to call. And I don't know, you know, it's I can't do anything. Uh, you know, they give me an audition. Maybe I can blah, blah, blah. And I realized that's like a losing <laughs> attitude, because what I saw was a woman who went, hmm, uh, who can I call? What can I do? Who must I reach out to? Who must I meet? Uh, should I do a play? Absolutely. I should do a play and I should let everybody know that I'm doing this play. And even though it's a crappy play and I'm getting no money, I'm going to do it. And I looked at that and went, okay, I see you need to promote yourself. She hired a PR person. She always had a PR person and, and, you know, would utilize that, uh, in any way that she could. So that was a, and then like, well, how do you live and raise kids and pursue this weird career that is so herky jerky what do you do? And, and I saw how she did it. She would economize and we hired out, uh, we, we, <laughs> she always remembers this. We rented out one of the bedrooms in our house. Mind you, we have three bedrooms. <laughs> we, we, we hired out a third of our house to another, to like a college student because, you know, that was 60 bucks a month or something yeah, that she yeah. would get and shared a kitchen with this person. And uh, she, as I said, she would do plays and she would volunteer for things and she would uh, push it along, push it down the road. And I, I remember vividly seeing her rehearse lines for an audition over the sink while we're, you know, getting ready to have dinner and, and, and she's going to take or lunch or something. And she's going to take off in a minute in the car and drive to Hollywood and do this audition. You juggle, you know, you, you but, but she's a hustler. And I realized in the sense of a hard worker, you know, she was yeah. a, a, a depression era child. And I think that came as just part of the territory back then. But, but even more than other people her age that I observed, she was just intent. And, and it came from this vision that she had of, as a, as a girl, of seeing her name on a marquee and changing her name to, so it would look better and, and just being like, I'm going to do this which I recognize now from, from my life experiences and from my own philosophy, that it's like, that's a very smart way to go about it. Yeah, it really is. You know, it's interesting in looking at your career and then looking at my friend, Mr. Cunningham here, who I've known for 30 some odd years. Oh, wow. And seeing that you both have a very similar mindset when it comes to uh, not saying no to things. I learned that from Jim. Don't say, don't necessarily say no to something right away. L listen to what it is. Right. Uh, a lot right. of times you're going to accept stuff just because you're not doing anything else and why not? And you never know where it's going to lead. Uh, and and um, you both have this living in sort of limbo world of, I don't know what's coming next, but because you've said yes so often and because you're easy to work with and because you bring the goods and because you have so many different threads, there's almost always something coming in because you've just kept the streams open. Um, and, and that's what I, I, that's why I wanted Jim to meet Jim, because you, you, you both represent the same thing, just in different towns. Soul but now, brother. Soul yeah, brother. Exactly. Well, I'd like to think. Yes. <laughs> but, but now you have an online course to help actors become working actors, um, because there, I think there's a real difference between an actor and a working actor. You know, I'm in the low budget movie world and and there's a difference between being uh, a screenwriter and a screenwriter who's working or being a director and being a director. You can say your thing, but to actually be working at it on an ongoing basis doesn't necessarily just happen. And it sounds like in your course, you're going to walk people through that process. Yeah, I really tried to do that. That's exactly right. Be you know, I mean, you can break down a career, uh, uh, and I'm sure Jim understands this very well, like you have the production side of things, which is the rehearsing, showing up, acting, great. And everybody's focused on that. They're like, that's what acting is. And it's like, well, that's right. That is one sliver of the job. The other sliver is marketing. There's also a kind of a sliver that's like having the big goal and the vision and sort of the planning and being the, you know, the visionary of, of the organization, because you're an organization, you know, there's finance, there's paying bills, there's, uh, you know, keeping oneself fit, medical things, all these, there's a lot of different moving parts to it, right? And, and most of us think, though, of acting is like, oh, yes, there I am on the stage holding the skull, giving the speech to Yorick, like, okay, that may happen. <laughs> 
that may be part of it, but that's not that's that's like an eighth of it or or a, or a fifteenth of it. So in my course, I've tried to share what I those other parts of the slivers, the other slivers, the other parts of the organization that I do, because I was paying attention. Thank God, it, it didn't just happen by luck. It happened very concertedly and very determinedly. So I know what we did. And when I say we, I, it's, it's, I've got a little team of people, you know, it's my, it's with my wife and now my daughter helps me, agents, managers, uh, other people to, to actually keep it rolling because it is that, that kind of life, the freelance life. And, and there are many different kinds of freelancing uh, lives that people can lead, but in, a, in an actor freelance life, you don't know the next week. Like I look on my calendar. Well, I looked at my calendar yesterday and I went, wow, there's a lot of blank space on that calendar. And yet there is no blank space in, you know, my, my bills summary. I, I, I'm going to have to pay <laughs> whether <laughs> there's something or not. So now today, because of all the promotion that I do during the week, now I have a couple jobs. So I, and I'm not, I never sweat it because probably like Mr. Cunningham, I, I know that, all right, these are the actions that I have to do. And I know that that schedule is going to fill out. It's going to fill out ahead of me, almost like a train track rolling out in front of the steam engine. So in the course, yeah, I've tried to, uh, I've composed a bunch of different videos where I talk about certain uh, things about auditioning, about promotion, marketing, uh, and other very important aspects of keeping the career rolling. I don't teach acting. I'm not going to go there. You know, my wife has a wonderful acting school and anybody can check that out if they want to. It's called the Acting Center and they run online courses as well as in person here in LA. But I teach or I try to teach or I just share. I mean, I'm not teaching anything, but I'm sharing what did I do and what do I, what have I found after 35 years of doing this are the importances, important steps to take, the important actions to always keep in and what might happen and what, how, you know, how I've bobbed and weaved and, and, and kept things going so that I didn't have to take another job. I never had to back up and go, well, I retreat, you know, now I'm going to go and just go into teaching or now I'm going to go into, you know, uh, real estate uh, or nothing wrong with that. And I know a lot of actors have done it, but I have not had to. And uh, I'm a little bit stubborn at this point. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll go kicking and screaming into any other uh, non-artistic field. Good for you. Uh, yeah, without absolutely. without giving away too much of the course, let me just, uh, we've got a couple of questions that, that I'm always interested in when it comes to this sort of career. What's the biggest mistake that, a, that beginning actors often make? Yeah, I, I think the biggest single mistake is, is to have the right mindset uh, concerning who is creating the career. Because we come seemingly with hat in hand as actors to the audition, to the theater, to meetings, interviews, we, be, we can fall into the trap of thinking, I'm waiting for someone to give me something. I am kind of, you know, when we're really desperate, we're really like beggars and it can get pretty bad. And it, as any actor who's been begging knows, it just doesn't work very well. It's very unattractive unless you're, they're hiring a beggar <laughs> right. for the role of beggar, you know, then it's okay. All other times it's, it's really anathema. So I think it's a viewpoint of like, I am going to create this career. And that's what I saw my mom do. And that's what I exercised too. I totally mobilized that because I'm a creative person. I like to create. So it was kind of like, well, here's a good excuse. <laughs> you want an excuse to create? Guess what? Your whole career is up to you. you know, what you want to do, what you're good at, how, you, how much you pursue it, how well you do, how fast you go, how much you get paid. It's really kind of up to you. Yeah. And that may seem counterintuitive or stupid or, you know, bewildering to people as they just start out, because we are looking to collaborate. We are looking to fill a hole that someone else has created. You know, somebody is out there right now writing a part in a show that will need to be cast. And the casting director will be looking around for that person. Uh, that hole didn't exist until that writer came up with it. So in a way, they have created that. They've created that opportunity, that, that, that position that needs to be filled. But we can always sort of be ready for those things. And even, <laughs> I mean, I, I believe in, in sort of deciding and picturing things and putting things out there in the universe. So I, I do that. Sometimes I'll go, you know, somewhere, someone is writing a great part for me. And, uh, you know, it's very difficult to uh, actually link that to cause and effect. But the fact is, I've been working, as I said, for a long time. So I think it's just a mindset of you have to, like, take the hat out of your hand 
put the hat on your head or, or on a hook and, and go, you know what, I am the guy in charge. So how much money do I want to make? How much, what do I want to do this year? Take charge. Don't go, well, I hope if only, well, maybe if things go well, uh, somebody might possibly grant me. No, no, no. That's a losing attitude. That's a, uh, an expectation, you know, and a kind of a being the effect of something rather than actually trying to cause something. So it, it's a hard lesson to tell people because so much of life is sort of dictating that we behave like people that are created upon. You know, we are marketed at, you know, come, come and watch this movie, sit in the dark while we tell you a story and feel this way and laugh at this part and, you know, and pay this money. And okay, we get that all day long. There's stuff just shooting at us all day long. And at some point, the artist has to kind of sh shake it off and go, what do I want to make? I'm going to make it, you know, I'm going to produce it. I'm going to create it. And so that's, that's what I think is the biggest change, the biggest mistake that could just go through a whole lifetime or a whole career of a person is like, they're thinking like, God, the agent will give me the thing. And then I might, if I possibly do well, they will give me the part. And then maybe they'll keep all of it in and not edit out all of it. And, and then maybe they will pay me and, you know, all this kind of awful, <laughs> you know, slave kind of mentality uh, that as much as you can turn that around and you'll notice that the very big actors didn't take no for an answer. They developed their own projects. They were very, they were fussy sometimes. They were saying, I won't do that, but I'll do this. You know, they'll, they're demanding on themselves. Uh, and, and many of them have created their own things. Like I, I think of, I always think about Billy Bob Thornton. Would Billy Bob Thornton have the terrific career he does today? Uh, he's a great actor, but would he have the career that he has today if he hadn't uh, decided, man, I'm going to write this script and star in this Sling Blade thing myself? And, and yeah. You know, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I doubt it. And there's lots of examples of people like that because he wanted to do it because it was something he observed in life or had this idea. I think while he was on another shoot and he turned, you know, the material of his life into this project that he believed in and miracles happened. And a lot of stories like that. Yeah. So you had the advantage of growing up watching a working actor. So you had probably a bit better sense of that world than someone coming in from the outside doing it but was there anything that you were surprised by once you started being a, a, a full-time working actor uh one, one lesson that i learned very quickly was uh i probably would have had a commercial career about two years earlier but i made a mistake uh, a strategic error uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of potency to beginner's luck in show business we hear a lot of stories they're almost like legendary stories about people who went well you know i wasn't i didn't even have the audition i went with my buddy and my buddy didn't get the job and I did. I mean, you hear that there are a zillion stories like this, right? And I, same thing happened to me. I went with my friend to visit a girl who in an office who was working for Barbara Shapiro casting in, in, in Manhattan. And uh, I went to say hello to this girl. And she said, oh, by the way, you know, we're casting for this uh, beer commercial. So I got a call back. I got a second call back. I got a third call back and they pay you for the third call back. But in between the second and third callback is where I made my error because I had been doing, and, and it's funny because it was related to impressions and, and impressions has always been a kind of an open, a door opener for me. It was a Miller beer commercial with guys sitting around a campfire and at one point a guy stands up and does a John Wayne thing. That was me. They kept calling me back, kept calling me back. And then I had some stupid conversation with the girl that I had been going out with at the time. And she said, why don't you do Henry Fonda? And I went, yeah, I'll do Henry Fonda. And that was the end of that. So <laughs> the lesson I learned is a very important lesson that most actors pick up very quickly, but I just kind of screwed up is that if they keep calling you back, don't change anything. It's going right. If they ask you, you know, on the day, okay, well, we saw your John Wayne. I wonder, can you do any other voices? That would have been the perfect time to whip out your Henry Fonda as they say, but uh, I screwed that up and two years, two years before I got another really good opportunity. So never, I never changed anything now. Uh, you know, I always, uh, you know, I learned that lesson very quickly. When I did finally book a commercial, I had gone in and I got a call back and I remembered on the day I had like a headache. The day I did the first audition, I was cranky. And on the day I got the call back, I'm like that day, I'm like, well, I feel great. Well, I'm not gonna act like I feel great. I'm going to be cranky. And I, I went in and they booked, I booked that job. 
by applying this do not change anything. <laughs> Smart. A lot of people don't think that through, boy. That's uh, that's a really good tip. If you're an actor listening, that's that's the price right there. You just uh, you just gold just dumped right into your lap. If someone's yeah, it would be like if you went to a restaurant and you had the the halibut one time and you go, oh my god, this halibut's great. I'm going to come back. And if they serve you the halibut and now it's in a totally different sauce, you're like, what the fuck? I came for the halibut. <laughs> what happened? As you think about, you know, actors like me, can you point to some, you know, sort of generic, hey, this is, here's another trap. Don't fall into this one. Uh, or you, sure. something you see other actors kind of making that mistake again and sure. again. And it's, and it's related to my first comment about what's the biggest challenge in, in that in changing this mindset of like who's in charge and being in the driver's seat, if you will, of your career. And I think uh, I wind up talking to a lot of people, particularly guys our age, who maybe have not uh, made their peace with social media. Uh, but for me, it was a major uh, breakthrough to finally uh, have the discipline to get onto YouTube and begin that really what, what has become the last uh, 11 years of really just an interesting chapter of my life where I, I have something that I, I would have loved to have in New York, which is this access and ease of production. Anyway, uh, not to talk too much about myself, but just the, the fact that most actors are underutilizing, I think, the, uh, the technological reality of today of being able to share performances with the world and to generate interest in what you do and to also creatively expand and reach out and, and come up with content yourself that may not at first have any kind of monetary value to you, but as a product, as a promotional activity is, is virtually uh, free and can create uh, great windfalls and, 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 and attention. Yeah, I guess. Are you are you doing anything on uh, on YouTube or anything? You know, I'm really not, and I, I I not only am I not doing it, but you're the first person to suggest that if you uh, if you were to use that uh, in some way, that there would be a benefit there. Now, I don't. I'm not, uh, you know, um, a great actor, and I'm I, I'm more I'm better as myself than I am as anybody else in general, and that's mm -hmm. where the bulk of my work comes is being me in front of a camera uh, or on stage. Uh, and I don't, I, 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 you, the challenge has been thrown down now is well, what could I do on YouTube? And mm -hmm. could that affect? Because as, as you, you mentioned, as you get older, uh, the, uh, the opportunities decrease. They're looking for uh, a 30 year old. They're looking for a 40 year old and I'm not that anymore. And so uh, the, you, the, I always used to tell people what you want is the number of auditions to go down and the number of jobs you're doing to go up. That's the goal. And uh, now I'm finding that that is that is no that's no longer true for it's, me. It's inverted. Yeah. yeah, it's inverted now. Well, I can I can speak to a couple of points to that. So I understand about playing yourself and, and being like a spokesman or being like something a character that is more or less how you appear to other people. I would suggest that um, that you're even you're you're much bigger than that. You're much uh, more various than that. Your possibilities of uh, and potentials as just a, a human being are far beyond what your body might dictate. Mm. Uh, what how you look and how you even how you think about things, even some ideas you have. I, I think you're bigger than that as an individual. And one of the things that I love about acting is that one gets to occupy a completely different point of view. And for example, this is why I do a lot of impressions is because sometimes I can just change into another person and look at things from a completely different point of view. That's sort of the magic of it. And uh, I, I mean, the expectation of an actor generally is that they can do different things. Uh, you wouldn't buy a Swiss army knife and find that it has one blade and go, I'm really happy now. You'd go, wait, where are the scissors? Where is the ball peen hammer or whatever? To be an actor means I can play a lot of different characters. I can play a lot of different roles. Now, as we get older, maybe, you know, that gets narrower, but we can certainly always push, push it out. And I think you can surprise yourself 
by what you're absolutely you're actually able to do. You've got a lot of wisdom now. You've earned that over the years. You've met a lot of different kinds of people, and I think it's probably uh, something to take a look at. An actor, there. If you look at the job description, if there is such a thing, it's like knowingly taking on another point of view to help tell a story. That's kind of my quick definition of what it would be like. Yeah. So if you are facile and ready to occupy other viewpoints, to look at things from the point of view of someone who's, you know, just physically exhausted, or someone who's been just kicked around their whole life, or someone who's just won the lottery, you know, if, if we practice this, which is what they do at the acting center, just kind of changing viewpoints and looking at things from different points of view, then you discover that, you know, I, I can do a lot of different things. Because a human being is like that. A human being can adopt all kinds of different viewpoints and, and feel all different kinds of ways and express different kinds of emotions. And uh, there's a great freedom in that. And I think you'll, you'll blossom if you start to, start to, to, to have a, a little try at that. <laughs> I like that. That's good advice. I like you, it a lot. You know, it's interesting. You mentioned social media and we're all of a certain age and feel like things might be passing us by. But Jim Meskimen, you, though your use of social media, your use of YouTube, your, I found you on TikTok, your promotion of yourself does not seem like promotion. It does not seem like marketing. Right. It is just you having fun doing the things you do. And then in some cases, it's impressions. It's other cases, it's you doing characters that you've created. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's sort of the secret to promoting yourself on social media is do what you love and eventually people will find that and, and want to be part of that. Yeah. And there's a, there's an example. Thank you for noticing that. I appreciate it. And I'm having the, the best time. Two, two things I want to say about that. One is that uh, I, I don't know if you've ever uh, heard the, the uh, entrepreneur, Gary Vaynerchuk, Gary V, but he said something very, very helpful about branding because branding when we talk about branding, it immediately sounds like something we don't want to have anything to do with. Uh, but branding means reputation. That's another good synonym, your reputation. And we prove our reputation all the time by how we talk to people, how what we do, what choices we make. It's pretty simple. So if we let people know, hey, I was at this concert and I had a great time. Well, we know that about you. We know that you love Fleetwood Mac, you know, and that, that you had a great time on last Wednesday. That is your reputation too. If you create a character or you go to a play or you just say, God, you know, uh, this is on my mind and I have to say something about it. That's your reputation too. That's your brand. People get to know you that way. Uh, the other point I want to make was uh, in terms of like, you know, the volume of what I do and how it doesn't seem like, uh, doesn't seem like branding. It, it's just me having fun. And that is indeed <laughs> entirely what it is. There was a guy when I, when I was kicking around New York back in my twenties, in various uh, subway hubs, like Grand Central Station or Times Square in the subway downstairs, every now and then I would uh, walk past this young man who was um, a drummer and he was banging on, not, not drums, he had like a joint compound bucket and he had, I think I swear, I remember one time he had like the, 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 the crisper of, of a refrigerator, you know, the, the shelf, the drawer. Anyway, he was banging away on, on those buckets and those instruments, which obviously did not cost a lot of money. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, the sound just racketed through uh, the subway. And, and it, it sort of was, it sort of integrated. It, when you walked through to that drum beat, you were kind of like, yeah, I'm in New York and I'm walking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it was like, not for nothing. This is the right soundtrack for this little part of my life right now, you know, and how many people would walk by this guy every day it was in the hundreds of thousands, probably. Right. So there is a guy is a great example. If you think about it in terms of social media, this was a guy who was drumming for a massive audience every day. And were people giving him money? I never gave him a dime. I'm sure a lot of people throw, I mean, he couldn't have made more than, I don't know, 75 bucks a day. Who knows? Some, maybe he made more than that, but uh, that wasn't the point. The point was 10 years later, maybe, uh, or, or earlier, there was a production uh, called uh, Bring Out the Funk. Guy bring in the in noise, the bring in the funk. Bring in the noise, bring in the funk. This guy got hired. He was seen by the director. He was in that show. He was in a Broadway show. He was performing seven nights a week. I can guarantee he wasn't making $75 a day. <laughs> uh, and, and it just was like, oh, look at that. That's a great 
very easy example of like, okay, this is what, obviously he loved to do it. Nobody said, here is the way to, to Broadway, get your bucket of joint compound, young man, and go, go the, to Times Square. No, not a chance. He loved rhythm. Uh, but he made it go right. And, yeah. and it, it, I don't know where he is today. I don't even know the guy's name, but I know that it was the big start of something with tremendous potential for him. You know, follow your bliss, like they say. Yeah. And you, you never yes. know. I have two working actors in front of me right now. Tell me about rejection and dealing with rejection and how you deal with rejection. Oh, good question. Yeah. Rejection is like a kind of a, a shock to the beginner uh, because we kind of know it's coming, but it still hurts. And uh, the fact is that it is, um, it's something that you have to kind of make friends with, which sounds really, really impossible. Uh, but like, I just watched a video of a guy who, uh, I think it was Joe Rogan. I watched a little on TikTok. Joe Rogan was talking about this ice cold bath that, you know, it's, it's now a thing to do these uh, super cold plunges to try to uh, handle inflammation in the body. And I watched him because I, I wanna see you go in that bath. <laughs> And he went in and like, how long is he going to stay in that thing? It's 34 degrees, just above freezing. But he was in there. I, I lost interest. So he, he went on for minutes and minutes. But uh, in a way, uh, being judged and, and being rejected is like that cold bath. Now, Joe Rogan said that he went the first time he went in that bath, he could do it for about a minute. And then he got the hell out of there and went into a sauna. Probably now he can go in for 15 minutes. So it's, it's, it's like, it was like that for me with rejection because, you know, you, you prepare something it's, it's, and when you're an actor, it's, it's different than other jobs because other jobs, if you're producing like um, even a piece of artwork, you know, it's exterior to you. It's, it's not you, it's that piece of paper. It's that object that you've created with a, a, an acting job. It's like, oh, it's your hair, your body, your face, your tone of voice, your presence, your smell. It's all what you're offering, you know, you're, you, whether you want to or not, it's there, uh, especially in the, in the pre-Zoom days. So the, the, the levels and the dynamics of you being judged are just exponential. You know, you're like, wow, I just, oh, you didn't like the way I sat. You didn't like the way I said that one word, you know, it's like, ah, oh, there's all these, all these swords to die on. But if you recognize and, and get familiar with the, the procedure, then after a while, that, that bite that it had originally does start to taper off. And at this point, you know, and early on for me, it's like I'd done hundreds of auditions. You know, I'm like, you know, some I get, some I don't get. Unless somebody says something really cruel, which is a whole different category of thing, right? There is just the natural judgment and evaluation that is part and parcel of being an actor where they go, thank you very much. And you never hear from them again. You go, wow, that's one thing. If someone says... Yeah, you know, you're not quite right. You're not quite good enough. Um, boy, we were really expecting something better. Or, wow, that's, that sucked. You know, I mean, that there's a whole range of, of othernesses. Then that, that is something that you don't necessarily get comfortable with. But after a while, you kind of gird your loins and go, well, if that comes up, I have a different response to that. You know, I'm going to say a little something or I'm going to make a mental note this casting director is an asshole, but that's different. The, the everyday kind of, thank you very much for coming in uh, rejection. That's just something that if you do it enough and, and if you're not too precious about it and you don't take it personally, because it is not personal. It absolutely is not. You know, one good thing too is to go, if you're an actor and, and I've, I have not done this, so I'm giving you this advice that's kind of uh, uh, secondhand, but go and participate in a casting process uh, where you're not being cast. Watch other actors come in, be a reader or something uh, and, and observe the variety of people that come in and what is attractive and what is unattractive and what is distracting and what is not distracting. And it'll give you some reality on like, oh, okay, it's we've interviewed or we've auditioned 15 people for this role, 12 of them could do it. They were fine. But this one's hair is this way. And this one has a little better this. And, you know, and I, I don't know, I, I met this guy before. I'll work with him again. They're arbitrary, small kind of gentle reasons why the person gets hired. And it doesn't have to do with, uh, it's not the Roman arena where they go, thumbs down. you're dead now. Your thumbs down. You are a failure. You, it's your turn to be eliminated. <laughs> It's not that. It's like, yeah, you're great. You're great. I got nothing to say except the director wanted to work with this guy. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you got to make your peace with and go, yep, I would do the same thing. If sure. I was a director, I want to work with this guy. I, who cares? It doesn't matter. Yeah. I still remember William H. Macy saying once he was on a TV show and went up to the producer director, the guy in charge, and said, thanks so much for casting me in this. And the guy said, yeah, it was between you and another 5,000 people, but you'll work. <laughs> yeah, I just found out, uh, uh, interesting, I, I got a role in a show that I'm going to work on next week. And I was like, wow, great. You always, you know, these days, Jim, you know about this, you do these at home, you know, self-tape auditions. And it's yeah. like, it doesn't seem to, it, it seems fake. It still seems kind of like, I'm not, I'm not in show business, am I? I'm yeah. just doing it in the back of my house. But they call you up and they go, you know what? We want you for the role. And I'm like, oh, what? okay, great. And I'm all chuffed about it, you know, excited. And, and then uh, the wardrobe man, when I went to the wardrobe fitting, uh, for reasons of his own, I'm sure, told me that, uh, yeah, they originally uh, were trying to get, uh, they, were, they originally hired another actor to do this uh, part. And then the schedule changed. And uh, so he couldn't do it. And so then I found out, you know, in that, sort of covert way that I was not the first choice. I still get to do the job. Yeah. Uh, but that's another, you know, aspect of things that could come in and sour things. And you can start to feel sort of like a victim a little bit. But you know what? I just look at what am I trying to do? I'm trying to get bigger and better parts in bigger and better shows. So that like like Jim said, Maybe, maybe I don't have to do so many auditions. Maybe they come to you and say, we have an offer. I love that. That happens sometimes. But I am also very happy to audition. I'm very happy to meet with people. Because yeah. for me, I look at uh, an audition is a performance, yeah. especially these days when they expect a performance. They, they don't particularly, I don't hold the script. I memorize it. I work it out. I spend hours and hours and hours getting that show together and shoot it to the best of my ability, put the best sound on it that I can, and fire it back as quickly as I can. And it's fun for me. I like the activity of acting. I like the activity of portraying a different person, of trying something out. Uh, and and that's, that's the joy of it and the chore of it. Jim Meskimen's joy in the art and craft of acting is not only evident in our conversation, but also in his work. As I mentioned before, if you want to hear more about his work as an impressionist, check out episode 222 of Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast. It's a fun and fascinating conversation. You'll find a link to the podcast in the show notes. In those show notes, you'll also find links to Jim Meskimen's website, his acting reel, and a link to the Acting Center. If you enjoyed this interview, you can find lots more just like it on the Fast Cheap Movie Thoughts blog. Plus, more interviews can be found in my books, Fast, Cheap, and Under Control, Lessons Learned from the Greatest Low-Budget Movies of All Time, and its companion book of interviews with screenwriters called Fast, Cheap, and Written That Way. Both books can be found on Amazon. And while you're on Amazon, check out my mystery series of novels about magician Eli Marks and the scrapes he gets into. The entire series, starting with The Ambitious Card, can be found in paperback, hardcover, ebook, and audiobook formats. And if you haven't done it already, check out the companion to the books, Behind the Page, the Eli Marks Podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts. That's it for episode 108 of the Occasional Film Podcast, which was produced at Grass Lake Studios. Original music by Andy Morantz. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you occasionally. <laughs>